Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and today we'll be talking about molecular orbital theory. Uh, we're first going to start off with um, a homonuclear uh, molecule, and then we'll move to a heteronuclear molecule. So, MO3. So we're going to start with qualitative rather than quantitative MO theory. One, because we're not using a supercomputer, and two, we can gain a lot of valuable information uh, from just looking at some basic rules to try and understand how molecules come, or excuse me, how atoms come together to bond. So the rules, uh, the very first rule is, is the number of atomic orbitals, AOs, must equal the number of molecular orbitals. Two, bonding MOs are lower in energy than its constituent AOs. Three, anti-bonding MOs are higher in energy than the constituent atomic orbitals. Four, non-bonding MOs are the same in energy as the constituent atomic orbitals. Non-bonding MOs are the same energy AOs. Five, AOs of the same symmetry, atomic orbitals of the same symmetry, overlap to form the molecular orbitals. So AOs of similar symmetries Overlap to make MOs. Six, atomic orbitals that are close to one another in energy most effectively overlap. AOs of similar energies most effectively. molecular orbitals, and the last rule, the lowest of energy MO fills before a higher in energy MO. So lowest energy they fill first. Okay. So let's look at a simple example. Let's start with the simplest molecule we can think of, H2. And let's try to describe uh, what, what's happening when the atomic orbitals overlap to make molecular orbitals. And we'll draw a molecular orbital diagram. Well, let's erase this first. So, returning to H2. So we're talking about H2, the number of atomic orbitals. We have two S orbitals, so we have two. We know the number of molecular orbitals that we should have, should match our AOs. So we're going to have two molecular orbitals. Uh, the way that they look like, or the, their wave functions, excuse me. We have the first MO of H2, and we have the second MO of H2. We have our normalization constant, comes from quantum mechanics when we're normalizing a wave function, and then we have the basis function on the first atom, so we have HA and we have HB. Since we're talking about um, just the hydrogen atom itself, we have a 1s orbital there. And a plus 
of 1s orbital on atom B. So now the only other option is, is we can change this wave function. We can either make this uh, basis function or this atomic orbital negative, and this one positive, or this one negative and that one positive, meaning they're switching signs. The wave functions are moving in and out of phase with one another. So our other MO will have a negative sign. these two. Okay, so let's consider what's happening at each of these. For H12, we have our first atom and our second atom. So we have an s orbital that looks like that. We can draw the other s orbital on the other. That's overlap in one region, which is a sigma bond. Whereas with our other situation, we notice there's a node down the center. There is overlap there. That's a sigma star. If we allow those orbitals to mix and overlap with one another, the bonding orbital will look kind of more like an oval or like a, um, an ellipse. Whereas the anti-bonding we know that we have to have a node in the center, so there will be no, um, the wave function won't exist at that point, or the molecular orbital won't exist at that point. And since there is destructive overlap between these two orbitals, we should get something that looks like this. Okay. So now let's try to draw um, the molecular orbital diagram. What we're going to do is we're going to put our energy as our y-axis. We indicate our fragments, so we'd have our hydrogen A, hydrogen B. They each have a 1s, and there's one electron in those 1s's. Now, the 1s's overlap with one another, and we form H2. We get two orbitals, we get on um, the sigma bonding and our sigma star. The important point is, is this energy along here is actually greater, or the distance between that is greater than um, between the atomic orbitals and the bonding orbital. Now let's fill our electrons since the system only has two. We fill one up, one down. Okay, so that's a pretty simple MO diagram. But let's talk about um, other characteristics or other things you have to look out for when drawing molecular orbital diagrams. The first thing we're going to discuss is the quality of overlap. Just checking to make sure this is recording. We are good. So, uh, the quality of overlap is determined by one, the symmetry to how far away the constituent atomic orbitals are from one another, and three, just the overlap itself. So the quality of overlap. So the better the overlap between the atomic orbitals, the lower in energy the bonding orbital becomes, and the higher in energy the anti-bonding orbital becomes. Bonding, MO, and the higher the anti-bonding. So as an example, what we're going to do is, is we're going to draw three systems. We'll have the energy be our y-axis, and what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at H2, but we're going to constrain that bond distance. We're going to have three angstroms, two angstroms, and one angstrom. So uh, we got 
three angstroms, which is a really stretched bond, two angstroms, and one angstrom. Uh, the average bond length of an H2 atom is around 0.74 angstroms. And now what we will do is, is we'll indicate our fragments. Okay. That should be the same in energy. So as we draw these out, keep in mind they should be on the same should be the exact same height all the way across the board if they're degenerate. Try to draw it that way. That looks better. Okay. Now the first MO diagram that we drew is going to be representative or most closely represented by this guy here. That's around the equilibrium bond length for uh, H2 atom. So we'll get a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. So sigma, our sigma star. Now, as we start pulling those atoms away from one another, their overlap gets worse. And what ends up happening is, is the bonding orbital should rise a bit in energy. And the anti-bonding should lower a bit. And when we look at uh, three angstroms away, uh, that bonding orbital, it's not going to be lowered in energy much at all. So what you can see is, is as the quality of overlap gets better, this dispersion or the distance between the bonding and anti-bonding orbital begins to increase. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep track of are symmetry labels. So we've been neglecting some information on our molecular orbital diagram where uh, we can talk about the symmetry of each of these orbitals, the sigma and the sigma star. So let's talk about symmetry labels. So we tend to label our MOs uh, with symmetry labels. So if you look at your irreducible representations uh, back in your character tables, what you'll see is, is there are a handful of symbols that you can write. For our sake, uh, we're going to ignore that for the moment, and we're going to look at just keeping track of U and G labels. So MOs are labeled by symmetry. And just with those irreducible representations that we've seen in character tables previously, uh, the subscript G for, for Gerard, it's symmetric to inversion, where you and Gerard is not symmetric to inversion. So let's hop back to our example of H2. You're going to get sick of drawing the MO diagram if you aren't already. We got sigma, sigma star, two in that orbital. So let's draw what these orbitals look like. So our sigma, we drew them mixing, and it looks something like that. Whereas our sigma star had a node in the center. OK, so if we look at these, there is symmetry, or at least with respect to inversion, for the sigma, for the sigma star, it is not. If we put look at that point of inversion there, 
this positive load becomes negative, this negative load becomes positive. So this one is not symmetric with respect to I. So therefore, we would give this guy the symmetry label sigma G and this one sigma U. And that will be important for when we start talking about larger homonuclear atoms. One last thing, um, let's talk about bond order. So bond order is a gauge of how strong a bond is. Uh, when we draw Lewis structures, we just look, is it a double, single, triple, quadruple bond? But when the bonding situation gets more complicated and we can't express it very well uh, without using a molecular orbital diagram, we use bond order to describe how strong is the interaction between the atoms. And bond order. It's a measure of bond strength. And it's related to the number of bonds you would draw in a Lewis structure. And it's simply calculated with the following for formula. Bond order is equal to one half times number of electrons in bonding orbitals, MOs minus number of electrons in antibonding MOs. Okay, let's hop back to our example for H2, even though I keep erasing it and we keep drawing it. Calculate the bond order for this system. It would be one half times, we count them up for a number of bonding, we only have one bonding orbital, so two minus number of electrons in anti bonding orbital, zero. So two divided by two, we get to a value of one, which makes sense because if we draw the Lewis structure for H2, there's, we can see that there's a single bond between um, those two hydrogen atoms. So with that, I hope I gave a decent primer of molecular orbital theory, and hopefully you can use this as we go further into other systems. Uh, we're also going to cover larger uh, homonuclear atoms and, or excuse me, molecules and heteronuclear molecules. So with that, I'd like to thank you. If you have any questions, please leave comments below. Thanks.